so I don't want drugs. I have something much better. I have a future that I'm going to fulfill my destiny, and I don't need your junk. Turn him down, tell him no. Turn him down, tell him no. Turn him down, tell him no. Those words turn are the down. advice that Rosie Greer sends out to every young person. Turn him down, tell him no. He's talking about drugs. He's talking about pushers of alcohol, marijuana, crack, diet pills, heroin, the works. Rosie says, tell him no. And those words of advice apply to friends at school, too. Peers, the so-called nice kids, the ones that everyone wants to be popular with. You know, pushers don't have horns. They're simply anyone who offers you any kind of a mood-altering substance. It doesn't matter if they do it for fun or for profit. If they suggest a beer, some pot, or something rougher, they are pushers. It's a tough call when you have to say no to them. But as Rosie Greer says, tell him, I don't need your junk. Tell him, no. River Park of South Dakota presents another in its distinctive series, It's Great to Be Alive, an unique television experience. This episode features Rosie Greer, famous for his role in the fearsome foursome of the Los Angeles Rams. Glenn Jorgensen and the River Park production team talked with Greer in Los Angeles, where he is renovating lives of many young people of the inner city. Greer's social work is some of the finest in the country, similar to that of River Park's, as he mends and reconstructs the lives of hundreds and hundreds of hurting people. He's mending at the same time that corner of the inner city of LA, where they live and work, a huge task. Now, let's join Glenn, and later his guest, Rosie Greer. Thank you for joining us as we talk with Rosie Greer. He's quite a man, and River Park is proud to have him with us. You know, a major social project, whether it's the renovation of a city or a person, demands superhuman energy. It demands a combination of commitment, adrenaline, and grace under pressure to achieve success. In the early days of Hollywood, stunts like this one of Harold Lloyd's were done live by the actor himself with no nets or fake effects. He needed that combination. Rosie Greer needed it too to get his social project started in Los Angeles. River Park needed it to expand their life-saving philosophy into the Black Hills of South Dakota and through the gently rolling prairies of the eastern part of the state. And all the time that renovation is going on, you wonder where the strength is coming from, how you can stand eyeball to eyeball with the possibility of failure in a stare-down battle for a person's life or a community project's success. Yes, it takes a superhuman energy to do the impossible. I want you to meet a man with that quality right now. Let's go to that day in Los Angeles when we talk to one of the fearsome foursome of the Rams, still fearsome, Rosie Greer. Rosie, we're both trying to bring about the same results of helping people to uh, uh, find their way out of difficulties and find out that it truly is great to be alive. I'd appreciate it if you would tell us the basic components of your efforts out here under your program titled, Are You Committed? What, what are you trying to do? What are some of the components of your program? Well, what we do basically, we, we're not really a, um a drug, a drug program. Uh, what we are is we are people program, and, and, our, and our, our, our ministry actually. And our purpose really is to to find young people that um, that we want to train to be leaders. We go. We have Bible classes in the projects. We um, we find young people come in the store. Uh, we sit down, talk. We go to schools. We go to churches. We go to we stand on the street corners. We uh, where the kids are. We have. Uh, one guy that's full-time out in the street, and we have a couple part-time guys out in the street all the time out there talking to young people, seeing where they are, visiting with them, going to their homes, uh, going through whatever problem they're going through, going to the courts and going to wherever the kids are. We, we want to be there to let them know that we stand with them. We want them to, to realize that we think a lot of them. We know that they have great potentials, and we realize that it's easy for anyone at some point in their life maybe to get into problems. And yet, the, there's a way out of it. But the idea is you must make a commitment. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. 
we, 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 we preach it, we teach it, and we live it. We, we're not just uh, believing, just talking about it. That's we want to live to be, be part of what he is about, to feed the hunger, to close the naked, to, to visit those that are shut in, and to do all these things. But, but when we find a person that's down in the street, we want him to get going again. So whatever we have to do to try to help him, we will. So you, you go into action. You're yeah. teaching these people yeah. how to make a living. Because I, and what I've learned in in uh, many years now of working with people is that they they need the the feeling of self-respect of, of being productive of having jobs skills they need yes. skills most you see what we found that I, I, I've been uh, we've seen a lot of young people today and that's a tragedy is that they can't read I mean without reading I mean I cannot believe that um, the society that we live in today would be able to, to turn out stand people. that the young people that are coming out of school cannot read. And what that does to their, to their self-esteem, you know, I, in working with people that, uh, uh, that come into treatment who can't read, and, and usually they, they try real hard to cover it up. Right. But They're when we, good. Yes. They're good at it. And they've had to, they've had to learn to survive. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, uh, but once, once you can get them admitting it and begin to work on it, yeah. and once they get through their embarrassment, because they're, they are, they're, they're they feel uh, low, they feel worthless, and uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so are you actually going into to elementary reading teaching? Yeah, what, we, what we're doing, we, we're setting up um, uh, reading programs here. Now, Pat Robinson, uh, they've, they've come up with some very unique um, uh, reading tools, and so what we're trying to do is get some of their tools so we can uh, be more efficient in our work here and, and trying to develop uh, the kind of uh, reading program that's needed so what we try to do is, is now is trying to set up program more in the community itself, right in the community, so the kids can come in after school and come into the program without you know without having to go over here or there. And that's see that's been one of the biggest problems is that uh, kids have to go all over town for the service. Mm -hmm. They got to go here and here and here. So we what we try to do is centralize some place where the kids can come in there and get all kinds of uh, uh, you know help that they need. So this becomes kind of a community. Community center to a degree, then. Yes, a okay. place where young people are. People can come and, and talk about their problems, and people that don't have work, some of them come in and they, uh, uh, we give them various kind of tests, and uh, also uh, we take their resumes and try to get them to various places who are looking for workers. How's it being received, Rose? Well, I we we've gotten a lot of people, um, but it's a lot of it's a lot of hard work because one, the people don't have the skills. So what you have to do is, is try to help them develop those skills and try to direct them to places that are training. Or if we can't do it ourselves, try to direct them to places that are training. You know, like a lot of young kids don't realize that they can go to the Job Corps and get trained in a lot of different kinds of skills where when you come out, you got a resume that I can, I'm a cook, I'm a mm -hmm. painter, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a mechanic or whatever. But see, these skills are so necessary today because of the... Um, you know, the high flux of te technology today that young people today have to have a specific skill. You can't say, well, I can do anything, yeah. but what can you do anything? What's anything? Well, that's not how you look for a job. I'm a mechanic. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm an Indian chief. Let me go out and do that, you know. So that's what's necessary today, that young people learn a specific skill. I would dare to say that I would, I would love to see schools today graduate young people with a specific skill, mm -hmm. a trade. Of course, voca more of a vocational training. Yes. 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 What about the uh, families of these people that you work with? Uh, do they get involved? Are they supportive? Or are you able to get them involved in, in the... Uh... Well, a lot of the families, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the families are uh, one uh, family person. I mean, like, like first there's a mother, a mother with, with uh, children. Yeah, and so a lot of the uh, families are, are broken, a lot of broken families. So, uh, but you you try to get uh, the moms and dads involved always you know we we want them to be involved uh, but we don't specifically go out after them but we try to do is get the young people and let the young people draw them in mm -hmm. draw them so, in so that they know that what well, we try to do is let the parents know that they're in good hands mm -hmm. and and that's what we would really do we we you know we send notes and we take the kids out on a trip or something they got to get the permission from the parents and and so all that uh, 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 if we take them into a bible class they know that they're in a bible class so we don't we try to do everything so that they know what the children are being fed, sure. so they know yeah. how to deal with that. So basically, yeah, we want uh, more participation on the part of the parents because we want more volunteers to get involved in trips and in the teaching. That's a good uh, description of what I've what I've seen in the in the time that I've come to know what you know something about your program. 
the, the old axiom to know thyself. Uh, basically, this is what you experienced, was to try to come to know who you really were and find mm -hmm. out you were a child of God. And, and is this, is, would this then be part of what you're trying to help these, not only young people, but, but hurting people to do number one, and knowing that then to find out that they are worthwhile people, yes. children of God? Yeah, you see, you, see, you know, the thing that I oftentimes I think about, why does a guy kill himself? Or why does a woman kill herself? And I realized that, that in my own life, because what I got real depressed one time, and, and I really understood why, because you, people get afraid. They are afraid to, to live, they're afraid to die, and, and the bad news keep rushing in, the fear keep rushing in. So they want to get off of that cycle. And so they do anything to get off. And if you have no one to call on, no one to turn to, no one to, to, to touch and say, tell me that I'm okay, tell me, I, you, know, it, you know, like you don't want to call your friends. I didn't want to call my friends because I was down. I didn't want to call my friends because sure. they didn't want to hear this crazy guy talk sure. about what he was talking about, that I was hurting and successful like I am. You know, I had money with the president and all this kind of stuff. And so um, I began to realize that, that a man needed to know something that would maintain him in those critical areas of critical times and that relationship had to be with God mm -hmm. and so that's when I began to to my foundation began to become firm and I began to build on that foundation I got in the Bible began to study and I began to understand also I began to understand that a man that get involved in drugs and alcohol a lot of those reasons is because people tell them that if you do this and you become successful. And that guy can re-rush out and achieve that, that success, and he says, oh man, I made it. And in a, in a little while, he's empty again. And he keeps going from this high to low, high to low. And there's no consistency in the thing that people tell him until that man finally find out that all those things that he strived so hard to achieve or get didn't satisfy him at all. Isn't, isn't Rosie or is part of what's happening in the, in the, in the field of uh, professional sports. And, and uh, I don't know, you'd probably know better than I, the extent of the problem uh, revolving around uh, uh, chemicals, uh, chemicals. But isn't it part of that? I, in talking to some of them, the, th that they, they look for this big success and this big high, and then they're suddenly there, they've got all the money you could ask for, they've got uh, you know, all the adulation, and yet there's something missing? Yeah. They, they, see. Uh, probably uh, they want to be a man, a man all their life. So they want to go up and be this big successful man, right? And they got they got all this success. They got this big contract, and they played a few years, and they made all pro, and they they've got all this money and whatever. And and they realize that there's still that little kid in that big old body saying, "What? What's going on, big fella? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, you told me when I got here I was gonna be a man, and they're not a man. They're, they're, and they they don't know what to do. And so uh, there again, they were told that. Once you achieve these things, you're going to be the man. You're going to be successful. You're going to be everything you want to be. You're going to have the, the, the perfect wife, the perfect everything, but it's not. So there's you're the still emptiness. afraid. You, now you begin to wonder, am I going to be able to keep this? Uh, or, or do they like me because I'm, I'm, I'm myself? Or do they like me because of who I am? Or what is it? So, mm -hmm. so all of a sudden, the, 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 all this doubt and confusion comes in because you're not really sure of who you are yourself. And men need to know that. Know thyself. Yeah. What about the sports scene, uh, Rosie? What, are we getting a handle on it? Or, or do you think there's a, that we're figuring out a way to help the, uh, uh, the stars through these times? I don't know how close you are to it these days, but are you, what's your feeling about that area? I don't, I don't think that we're getting a handle on it. I think it's, uh, it's an epidemic. It's, it's not only in athletics, but it's throughout the world, the nation. Uh, it's in every, I mean, I can't, doctors and engineers and True. soldiers and they're all involved in it and and the only way that that they're going to really uh, stop it is by uh, individuals learning the harm the the, the detriment of it uh, we got to get those young kids that are that in, in grammar school and we got to begin to teach them we got to begin to take away that 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 ground that the devil has been so adequately being able to to use through m movies and through magazines and all the the big stars and on the movies, you see the guy getting high and you see the glamour and all these kind of things. But they don't show you, very rarely do they show you the destructive forces that are unleashed through these things, how it kills and how it maims and, and wounds and, 
and destroy families and all these things together. See, they don't talk about that. All you see in the movies and all the glamour of it. But, and we, we've got to be able to, one, to uh, shock our athletes and let them know that, that you, are, you have a responsibility um, as an athlete to, to uphold a, uh, an attitude of, 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 uh, of respect for not only for yourself but for the game mm -hmm. and also more importantly for the children that, I, that, that like to look at these athletes and emulate them. So uh, I, I think the commissioner has got to and the athletes themselves have got to take some strong stand on the guys who, who are abusing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it, uh, has it increased since you were on the scene there? Well, uh, we, we didn't know anything about, about, the, about the drug. Well, we knew drugs, but it was alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that it, it was all part of the escalation of the, of the whole, uh, whole drug bit. I mean, mm -hmm. guys got, they've been drinking, they've got uh, hung out on alcohol, and then uh, some guy came along and said, this is not addicting, yeah. you can do yeah. this. Yeah. And so they got in drugs. Well, and and, and they problems. start out with the pills. They start out with the, the, the pet pills, and they, and they and they find out about the, uh, the marijuana and I guess all the other things that go along with that. It's all just a continual escalation mm -hmm. of the, uh, of the um, drug uh, culture. I, so, I just, uh, the other day, was visiting with, uh, with a gentleman who's involved with the, uh, with the um, baseball situations, and he had just returned from visiting with a young star baseball player million dollar a year or so income, living in this great big home. Of course, he couldn't see that he had any problem, and yet he was about to lose his career. He was in the process of losing his family, and he couldn't see it. And uh, that, that's when it gets tough, Rosie, because then the blinders are so deep that they can't get through that. So uh, I agree with you that, uh, that, that we've got to somehow help them to see that they're role models for our young people, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Not only their own lives, because no, I know uh, how what a difficult road it can be, but because of their responsibilities, and you're putting that into action. From what I've seen of your program here, you're uh, you're headquartered here in in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you call this downtown Los Angeles or uh, downtown, it, yeah, downtown Los yeah. Angeles. And uh, what I see seems to fit in with what River Park's philosophy is, and it's and I don't want to get on a soapbox, Do it. but I don't okay, know. But we believe uh, for the alcoholic, the drug dependent, and for the people around them, because it's a very, very devastating disease for everybody that gets involved. I mean, it, it, it almost destroyed me, it almost destroyed my family, and likewise others. And so what the person needs is to, to begin to feel good about themselves. So we say that if you treat a person as he is, he will remain as he is. But if you treat him as if he were what he could and should be, he'll become that. Mm -hmm. And your surroundings and your approach to this thing, to me, and you correct me, I'm, I'm sure I'm right, that's what you're saying. Hey, people, there's a better way, there's a good life, and you're showing it through action and through surroundings. It, you know, it, it is an exciting, these are, to me, uh, these times are so exciting, even though when we look at all the, the problems that we, that we can observe around us, yet we can truly uh, recognize also that what great potential we have as individuals. Uh, the idea is that a man, you find a man that's broke down the road. Uh, I oftentimes, I, I used to read about, you know, a guy who he gets broken down on the highway and he gets out and he's yelling and screaming. Or, or the guy who, who sees that his car is to have a flat, right away he goes, he does something about it. And so what we're saying that when we see ourselves, humanity, broken down on the highway, don't stand there and, and, and just, uh, just moan over the fact that we're broken down, but get out and start moving to, to, to change it, you know, because that's what it's all about. It's about individuals uh, uh, being able to, one, recognize the fact that they are in trouble, if there's alcohol or whatever, um, and, and be able to do something about it. Don't just sit there and say, well, I can't do anything about it. It's going to be painful and all that. But the idea is get moving, you know, and so that to me is what it's all about is to, and you and I, uh, we have a, a tremendous opportunity to, to motivate and encourage those that, uh, perhaps strung out there to get to turn around, but those that are heading that way say, "Hold it! A, I'm, I'm, that this this flag is a danger ahead. Yeah. You better stop now, otherwise, because it's going to kill you." Yeah, because that's yeah. really the bottom line of it that's all. That's right. We're always reading statistics about what a, a huge job or huge problem that we have with uh, with chemicals. Uh, 
your worthy real action is. How big a problem do you feel that we have, both on a national level and, and getting down specifically with our, uh, with our young people, Rosie? I think, it's, I think it's a tremendous problem. I know that um, a lot of areas, uh, a lot of the young kids have gotten into selling drugs to make money. Um, you know, particularly in the inner city, there is a, um, there's not a lot of work, and, and, and this, these things are available. They can make a lot of money. I know, I've had kids tell me, said, you know, you, you come tell me about being good and all that stuff, is I can walk around, I can have $1,500 in my pocket, and I can have a lot of money in my pocket, you see. And that's the whole thing, that, that they use the analogy that, well, if, if I don't do this, I don't have any money, but if I do this, my pocket is filled. And, and so uh, what you have to, uh, you know, uh, circumvent that by letting them know that what great potential harm and what harm they're doing to their brothers and sisters. And so you try to go through them through their heart and let them see that the damage that's being done there. But it's a tremendous problem. Mm -hmm. I, if you would take a survey, I would say that uh, probably 50% of most, 50 of a lot of kids, most of the children in the school areas have uh, tried drugs in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And the big drug uh, being cocaine now, is that Yeah, right? cocaine, it, it seemed to be the, uh, where they're heading. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they've been told that it's not addicting. You see, and that's the whole point, that the, the pusher and, and those people that are proponents of drugs, uh, they, they try to say that, you know, it's, you, you don't have to, I mean, you don't get, it's not addicting. So, so consequently, a lot of young people get into it innocently, uh, recreationally, they yes. say. And so, uh, but really, uh, I try to tell the kids that uh, th there's only one reason that the push is around. You don't have one message, one goal. He wants your money. That's all he wants, mm -hmm. nothing else. And so I think that to, 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 for them to understand that part, it, and they understand that. I mean, they, they, if you ask them what they want, they say, I want our money. And so if we can take away any kind of relationship other than that, that's all they want. They don't want nothing else. They don't want you to be successful. They don't want you to achieve any dreams. Uh, they want you to be able to pay that money to get the drugs from you. From, so uh, it, it's a huge problem, and it's, and it's nationwide. Uh, so programs like this is so necessary. Uh, you should be on the networks uh, to, so that people can understand that, that it's a major problem and there's a tremendous need of many, many people to get involved in it. Churches and, and all kinds of civic organizations should be out teaching the harm of it and mm -hmm. sharing with the young people to stay away from it. You've had a long uh, relationship, and, and I don't mean to get into a, a lot there, but when did you first get acquainted with the Kennedy family? Weren't you, aren't you close to the, or have been close to the Kennedy family? And yeah, it started um, probably in 67. Um, I went to Washington, D.C. To, to an affair that they were having to um, our to raise funds to send young people out in the country. Now, I had, I had admired the family for a long period of time because I first got involved during the campaign when John Kennedy was running here for the presidency. I, uh, I became, became a fan of theirs, of, of his, because of the, the, the campaign and because of his, his attitude and because of a, a lot of things that, uh, that was done there during that period of time. Uh, he spoke up for, for Martin Luther King when he was in prison and so I just kind of followed him on, on the way and kind of watched him over a period of time when Bobby was made uh, uh, Attorney General and all that. And so later on when I got to meet them, uh, I just fell in love with him and personally and we got to know him and we became friends. And when Bobby decided to run for the presidency, uh, that's when I really, uh, you know, got to really know them much more, spend more time with them. And after Bobby was killed, uh, I spent uh, 12 years trying to make it up to them for the loss of their sons mm -hmm. and uh, their brother and their fathers. So I just um, spent time with them and loved on them to encourage them. To, you know, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was yeah. a good relationship. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not using the past tense. It's it just, I think, over the past years, uh, uh, they've kind of uh, went uh, another way, um, and, uh, and I've gone another way in, in terms of, of our closeness as we had before. We don't have that now. Well, I mean, I so still involved. love them very, very much, yeah. You're so involved but, in what no, you do. No, it's not that. It's just, it, I think it's, 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 it was our difference in, in, uh, in a lot of areas, and so, uh, but I still love them very, very much, you know. Mm -hmm. The name of your place, uh, Are You Committed? I, I you know, I can't, uh, it, you, you just vibrate, Rosie, that you are committed. I think it's uh, 
awfully reinforcing, enforcing, and encouraging what you're doing here. We have uh, problems throughout the country. Hopefully, uh, this will become a model for what can be done in other areas. Uh, we'll certainly urge people to get involved and support uh, your project, just as you're supporting ours. And if we keep going, we're making progress. We see thing, good things happening. We see people finding out that it truly is great to be alive. Yeah. Sure Thank is. you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. That was the fearsome, fearless Rosie Greer, giving you an idea of how he's waging the war against drugs, how he's helping young people to see themselves as both the saving and the saved, how they can help each other be healthy and drug-free. We told Rosie we'd ask you to help his cause. Send what you can. Tell him it's from a friend of River Park. He'll appreciate anything you can do. It seems that the president, the television networks, and all of America are finally taking the same side in a war that River Park has been waging for years and years the battle against mind-altering chemicals. During the early days of River Park's history, it seemed sometimes as if the men and women of the organization were fighting alone for the lives and health of their patients. We rejoiced over each recovery. We wept over each lost battle. Now there's more help. America is talking about the problem openly, not quietly standing by just watching while our finest people drink, medicate, smoke, snort, and inject themselves to death. It's been going on for thousands of years. And now, as the use of drugs is corroding America, the land of the free and the fit, it is recognized as intolerable, a fact River Park knew all along. Parents, look at your children with wide open eyes. Yes, your child would do a thing like that. Believe me, it's not unusual for 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds to get into alcohol, cocaine, and pot. It's available, it's cheap, and it's a killer. If your child is hooked, he can figure out a dozen ways to hide the habit. But here are a few of the warning signs to look for. And as I said, look with open eyes. Look with love and concern. And don't hesitate if you feel uncomfortable with what you see. Call River Park for advice and evaluation, toll free in South Dakota. There will be help, without embarrassment or blaming. You know, the cocaine hotline is getting about 1,800 calls a day about teenage drug use. That means you're not alone. You and your youngster are part of an epidemic. The current flurry of proposals and activity against drug use will have a lasting impact only if you and I say, enough. We must say to our workmates and our schoolmates, to our neighbors, our friends, and ourselves, drug use is not socially acceptable. We must say, along with Rosie Greer, turn him down, tell him no. And then America will really know that it's great to be alive.